Number 10, Pasiphae and the Bull. The gods, man, they love to throw some bestiality as punishment at their will and pleasure. Um, Equus probably would have been their favorite Broadway show. <laughs> Everyone knows the story of the Minotaur, but do you know how it all got started? Well, let me enlighten you. King Minos begged the god Poseidon to send him a glorious white bull that he could sacrifice. The god obliged. He sent him the most beautiful, stunning creature from out of the sea, because the apparently bulls come out of the sea. Anyways, but when King Minos went to sacrifice the creature, he found he could not bring himself to kill such a noble beast, so he just killed another bull instead. Outraged by his disobedience, Poseidon punished him by making his wife Pasiphae fall into uncontrollable lust with the bull. She convinced an Athenian inventor to create a hollow wooden bull for her to hide in, kind of like a Trojan horse, that could facilitate a union. Yeah. Like a, a union. You get what I mean by that? Yeah. She then later gave birth to the one, the only, the Minotaur, which would later plague King Minos and all that fun stuff. You know, like the whole labyrinth thing. Yeah. That story. Weird. Don't understand it. But here it is. Number nine, Arachne. You'd think if someone was really good at something, they should be rewarded. But no, oh no, that's not how the ancient gods worked. Their egos were very fragile. Sorry. Okay, chill out. Anyways, Arachne was a girl who was an incredibly talented seamstress, which made her a little bit cocky. One day she was so proud of her work that she proclaimed that she was a better weaver than Athena. Athena was the goddess of wisdom and war, so not a good person to mess with. Athena warned her not to make such claims, but she ignored her, so the two faced off. The two had a weaving contest in which Arachne ended up winning in front of all of the onlookers, but Athena didn't accept defeat gracefully and instead of rewarding her, punished Arachne to feel immense overwhelming guilt, causing her to take her own life. But that wasn't enough for Athena. The goddess brought her back as a giant spider who would forever weave her designs in the forms of webs. Not very nice. Not very nice indeed. Number eight, Airy Sikthen. Are rich people rich because they're greedy or greedy because they're rich? Either way, Erisichthon was, bottom line, a very greedy man with wealth that spilled over. Kind of like the Sun King, really. Planning to build another feast hall for himself because he needed another one, he demanded that a massive grove of trees be cut down to make room. This grove, however, was sacred to Demeter, the goddess of Earth. But the men did as he asked, save for one tree. One tree was left standing, covered in beautiful wreaths, symbolizing every prayer she'd ever granted. When the men wouldn't do it, Erisichthon tried to do it himself. While doing so, he killed the dryad who lived in the tree, which really didn't bode well with the goddess. To suit his greed, she set down Lemos, the divine representation of starvation. Overwhelmed by a formidable hunger, the more he ate, the more he desired. He sold off his entire fortune, including his own daughter, to buy more and more food, but nothing would slake his hunger. Finally, he began eating himself, bit by bit, until he finally perished in his own greed, destitute and alone. So moral of the story is don't cut down trees, or don't be greedy and don't cut down trees. Number seven, the first actor. Lights, camera, action. Marlon Brando, Robert De Niro, Leo DiCaprio, some of the best actors of our time. Marlon Brando would probably say he's the worst in some sort of weird humble brag, but that's just the guy he was. However, who was the first? Thesipus, who jumped on the back of a wooden cart and began reciting poetry as if he was the character. <sighs> art. Today that would probably get you locked up in a rubber room, but back then, it was our thus inventing thespian theater. You gotta appreciate waking up one morning and just inventing a new art medium. Yes, I love to be in the back of carts. <laughs> Number six, Kronos. I like how the Greek gods are as like chaotic to how the world is in Greek mythology. It kind of makes a weird sort of sense, you know? This weird godly family was messed up from the very beginning, and if you don't know the original story of Kronos, then, well, here you go. Before the gods of Olympus, before Zeus and Hera, there were the elder gods Gaia and Uranus, and then their son Kronos, who married Rhea. Kronos overthrew his father, and when he heard that one of his children was going to do the same thing, he decided to eat them. All of them. Just 
gobbled them down like an aspirin. Rhea wasn't a huge fan of the whole thing, and eventually enough was enough. So when Cronus went to swallow Zeus, Rhea tricked him and gave him a rock instead. She stole Zeus and hid him away until the day he would be strong enough to return and overtake his father. Disguised as a cupbearer, he gave his father a purgative, which made him puke up all of his siblings. Together, they stormed against their father and overthrew him after 10 years in battle. Whew, that's a rough, that's a rough start to family life. Of, and then Zeus married his sister, and there was a whole bunch of ins and it's just, you know what I mean, you, you've heard that. Number five, Sisyphus. Oh baby, do I feel this one. Story of my life, honestly, day late and a dollar short. Some of you folks at home may also share the same fate as me and this chiseled Greek man doomed for eternity. This one is also one of my favorites. Basically, Sisyphus was cheating the devil. Cheating death itself, actually. After sliming his way out of the underworld one too many times, Big Daddy Zeus had to intervene. Also, when I say I relate to him, it's not because I'm a trickster who cheats my demise or cheats the, the devil or, or Hades. I'll explain. So, after Sisyphus had done what he'd done, Zeus sentenced him to roll a giant boulder up a hill for eternity. When he gets to the top, she rolls back down to the bottom and he has to start all over again, every day for the rest of time. Not just life, for time. Sometimes in life it feels like you're on a grind and you work and work and work and sometimes you go right back to square one no matter how hard you work. That sucks and that can be exhausting. But never give up, cause Chetty ain't and neither should you. Number four, Ixian. This one is confusing because it prompts a question I've never wanted to ask. How do you even make love to a cloud? When Ixion, the king of Lapiths and the son of Ares, married Dia, the daughter of Dionysus, he promised him a gift. However, when Ixion reneged on the promise, Dionysus stole some of his horses. Enraged, Ixion invited him to dinner to make amends, but instead pushed him into a fiery pit of coals. I mean, he is the son of Ares, like what you expect. He was banished for such a crime because it was completely uncool, but after a few years, wandering sad and alone, Zeus took pity on him and invited him up to Olympus. That's a good idea, where Ixion got the hots for Hera. Zeus decided to see if he would actually even try it, like would he even try it? And so he sent him a cloud shaped like Hera. Ixion did try it, and he made love with the cloud, and even stranger, it got pregnant. <laughs> Their union gave birth to the first centaurs who were literally and figuratively horny little half horse, half human people that roamed the world. <laughs> As further punishment, Ixion was thrown from Olympus, struck by Zeus's lightning bolt, and bound by Hermes to a fiery spinning wheel. <laughs> Some people just really don't deserve your pity, man. They just don't. Number three, Pythagoras. A squared plus B squared equals C, or, or something like that. Or as Google calls it, the square of the longest side of a right triangle is equal to the sum of the squares of the remaining two shorter sides. Pretty sure I heard my math teacher talk about that once, but it's not that important, right? <laughs> I'm not doing much math, and my high school math teachers. I digress. I shouldn't be mean because she was actually one of the best teachers I've ever had. The subject sucked, but she was great. Shout out to Miss Savage, you're the best. It seems the life and work of Pythagoras are somewhat of a mystery to the point where, well, it's like third hand information, and that's that's never good. A lot of him is told through that of Romans, which is then told through Germanic tales of him. So Really, we're just not 100% sure, but his math survived, so maybe there is some truth to it. Who knows? He, he made it to my math class, so. Number two, Pan. What a weirdo. Pan is literally the weirdest horn dog god who ever graced the planet Earth. Firstly, the way this dude came to be makes no sense. There are many versions, but one of them involves Odysseus's lonely wife getting jiggy with 108 suitors. Pan, like, Stamina, right? Pan had the hind legs and horn of a goat and was the god of shepherds, flocks, hunters, forests, pastoral music, and fertility. The last one being the most prominent. Let's Get It On by Marvin Gaye would have been this guy's anthem. He pursued everything and everyone, nymphs being his favorite. They would be so desperate to get away from him, they'd have to turn into trees, Mira, reeds. Echo was even killed by his minions when she denied him. He could also multiply himself, creating like a swarm of pan. He also, he's also the only god who ever died, but no one is quite sure how that happened. So again, another confusing thing about him. Number one, last but not least, Theestes and Atreus. 
This next one will have your brain scrambled by the end. Fiestes and Atreus were brothers constantly at odds. While their father, the king of Mykonai, was away at war, they seized the city and Atreus became king. He sacrificed a lamb with a golden fleece to seal the deal with Artemis and gave the fleece to his wife who was fooling around with his brother Thiestes and she gave the fleece to him. Thiestes made his brother swear that whoever had the fleece would be king. And thinking that his wife kept it safe, he agreed. Thiestes then showed the fleece. Astrius, pissed off, asked the gods for help. Hermes told him to tell Thiestes to promise that he would be made king again if the sun went backwards in the sky. Thiestes agreed thinking it was impossible, so Zeus made it happen. Then Atreus fed Thiestes his own sons for dinner unknowingly and banished him as punishment. I know. Then an oracle told Thiestes that in order to exact revenge, his own daughter had to have his son. Like, so he made that happen in the grossest way possible. And then, it sounds like I'm talking about like some dramatic like housewife show. And then the son grew up, killed Atreus, and Thiestes became king. But wait, Atreus' sons, Agamemnon and Menelau, came back, overthrew him, and Agamemnon finally became king, ending the whole cycle. <sighs> We're good. All right, I'm tired after that one. Number 10, Clash of the Titans. An Avengers level threat, baby. The Titans were the big bad giants who ruled over the earth and the gods. Naturally, they all got along and there were never any problems, ever. <laughs> Yeah, right. They fought like cats and dogs, though I never understood that because all the dogs and cats I know always got along great. But the Titans fought, and, and they fought some more. Until your favorite boy Zeus had enough and kind of took control over everything. It's Zeus, it's what he does. It's too bad Aaron Yeager wasn't there to help out. Number 9, Prometheus. Poor Prometheus. This is my favorite tale from Greek mythology. I think it's rather sad for Prometheus. All he wanted to do was give us the knowledge of fire, and, and look at all the things that we did with it. Forged iron and steel, heated our homes, so no one would ever go cold again. And we cooked, which gave Gordon Ramsay 23 hit shows and a reason to curse when asking for the lamb sauce. Where's the lamb sauce? Prometheus went directly against Zeus's orders, and if you didn't know, that's kind of a bad thing. It can wind you up in a rather unfortunate position. A position like being chained up and having a large bird come feast on your intestines. Like I eat mom's spaghetti. She makes a good spaghetti, thanks mom. You make a good spaghetti. Number eight, Icarus. I think we can all relate to this one, or at least have been told a version of this when we were flush. Things were going good for us. In a nutshell, Icarus got some wax wings and gained the ability to flight. Mind you, that was probably the dream of many ancient peoples. After Icarus got his wings, he got a little arrogant. He wanted to push his wings to the limit. Kind of like Iron Man in the first Iron Man movie. But instead of falling in a multi-million dollar super suit and looking handsome while doing it, Icarus sniffed one too many of his own farts and flew too close to the sun where he burned up in it. So what's the lesson learned here, folks? Keep yourself grounded and don't sniff your own farts. <laughs> Number seven, Leda and the Swan. Like, Zeus, head of the gods, the one we all should be looking up to was like questionably immoral. But like, I mean, when you're a god, you can kind of do what you want. This story hurts my head because I just, like how does A get to B? Anyways, Leda was the daughter of the king of Pleuron in Atolia and wife to Tyndarus. One day she wandered by the river Eurotas and Zeus fell hard for this bathing beauty, but he just couldn't show up in his true form because one, Hera, his wife and sister, was watching and two, she probably would explode if she saw his true form. So he went to Aphrodite to ask what to do and she transformed him into an immaculate swan. By either seduction or nefarious action, there's two sides to the story. Some say he her and others say that she was into it. I don't know. Lita became pregnant either way and gave birth to two eggs. Eggs? Inside the eggs were two sets of twins. One, the infamous Helen of Troy and Polydeficus, and the other two were born from Leda's husband, Clytemnestra and Castor. One pair was immortal and the other immortal, which is also still confusing because like, didn't Helen of Troy die? I don't know. There's also another version which is pretty much the same tale, except it was the goddess Nemesis, not Leda, and, and Zeus turned into a beaver and it was just really weird, so again, Confusing. No idea what's going on. Number six, Hercules. Hercules, Hercules. 
the strong one, or the one where Danny DeVito coaches him through the process of being a Greek legend. If Danny DeVito is coaching you through anything, that probably means you're gonna come out on top. And yes, before you start typing in the comment section, technically speaking, Hercules is the Roman copy of Heracles. I know. However, it's kind of one of those things that everyone just knows the one. So anytime a Greek dude shows up with muscles, you blush and you think of Hercules. As far as Greek mythology goes, it doesn't get any more classic than a super strong guy with abs and biceps. And maybe a little bit of olive oil on, I don't know. Number five, Statue of Zeus. Another one of the ancient wonders of the world. The Statue of Zeus was a giant seated figure depicting the almighty Greek boy at 41 feet tall. Made by the Greek sculptor Phildios around 435 BC, built inside the Temple of Zeus. The statue was made of gold and ivory, totally non-opulent resources, ornamented with ebony, ivory, and more gold. Can never have enough. However, it was lost during the 5th century, and really the only details we know about it are from the ancient Greek descriptions and representations on coins. When I pass, hopefully, I'll have left enough comedy for the world to enjoy. Maybe I'll get an opulent statue too. Just no ivory though, that's, that's cruel. So maybe we'll go for like an all maple wood statue or something, since I'm Canadian. Yeah, that sounds pretty good. Maybe a nickel for Sudbury or something, I don't know, something like that. Number four, King Midas. The lesson in this one, folks, is to be careful what you wish for. King Midas was being granted a wish. He wished for anything I touch be turned to gold. Now, I'm not an economist because I already have too many jobs on the internet, but you can imagine how at today's rate of gold, how wealthy you would be. Sheesh! Yeah, gold was valuable back then, but now, wow, we will. So his wish was granted, and everything he touched turned to gold, which for a good couple hours must have been the most fun anyone has ever had ever. Dude was seeing drachma signs. However, this wealthy gift he had been given quickly turned into a curse or a burden. Everything he touched turned to gold. That included his food. Because of this, he starved. To fix this burden, he bathed in a river, and it said that's why gold can be found in that river. I wouldn't mind having that power myself, but if I made food gold or even worse, what if I made my beer gold? Uh, the the heart. Number three, Alcyon and CX. This one kind of hurts my heart. I mean, honest. The love story between these two is just something everyone longs for. They were admired by humans and the gods, and yet they were still punished for it. What? Alcyon was the daughter of the god of wind and devoted wife to King Ceyx of Trachis. They were so in love with each other, they often playfully called each other Zeus and Hera. Despite many of the gods admiring them, and this was clearly an endearment, Zeus wasn't pleased. How dare they compare themselves to the gods? So he waited until Ceyx planned to visit the oracle, against his wife's wishes, who was concerned the wind he faced would be too harsh on the sea. Even her father had difficulty controlling it. But he did, and Zeus stirred a storm that sunk the ship. With his last breath, Ceyx prayed his body would be brought back to his wife. Hera took pity on the mournful widow and sent a messenger and the body back to her. After burying her husband, she flung herself into the sea to be reunited with him. The gods were horrified by Zeus's actions because they loved the two of them, so he tried to atone for his rash action by transforming them into kingfisher birds. Yeah, Zeus, turning them into birds, it really fixes everything, don't? You're fine. Number two, Medusa. I feel like a lot of people know this one. Medusa, the half beautiful lady, half head of snakes in her head and, and half monster thing with powers. Yes, I realize that was three halves and that doesn't add up, but you're talking to a guy who was voted class clown in the high school yearbook and not voted most likely to succeed in math. Cause I just wouldn't. But she was the Gorgon monster who would turn men into stone. I, I, I do know that. If they looked into her eyes. That was until your boy Perseus showed up like Link with a mirror shield and gave her a taste of her own medicine. What's the lesson on this one? I'm not sure. Maybe it's don't be so sure of your abilities. Maybe it's seeing things through. Or maybe it's having an extensive knowledge of tactics from a late 90s Nintendo character. That you, you never know when you're gonna need that. You never know. I, I, I know that stuff. That can come in handy. Number one, Pandora's box. I know you guys know this one, but this one is so simple. At first glance, it's not about turning things into gold or weird snakehead ladies or giants rising from beneath the earth to fight each other. It's a box. Something ain't good in that box, but it's just a box. So don't open it. I'm gonna say it again because there's gonna be people in the comment section that are gonna say, but Chetty, because you said don't open it, that means I really wanna open it. Imagine I'm Robert De Niro telling you not to open it. Nope, no way. Nope, not gonna happen. Nope, null and void. Don't do it. Don't do it. 
That's how you know I'm serious, because I did a bad impression. Oh great, somebody opened it! Yes, that's right, Pandora's box was opened and it said that all the evils of the world were released from the box. Good tale, good moral, but who the heck thought putting all those evil things in the world in the box was a great idea? Whatever happened to just having memento boxes? You know, you open up a thing like this is the time I farted on camera, this is the time I went to the cottage, you know what I mean? Whatever happened to that? Number 10, Greek Pyramid. Okay, so ancient Greeks. You got your beautiful women, olive oil, olives, togas, beautiful white buildings. I mean, come on, what am I missing here? Shout out to the Greek community, by the way. Chetty loves you, especially the Danforth. It's a Toronto thing. Well, what if I told you ancient Greeks built a pyramid? Two to be exact. What? I know, right? They are nothing close to the size or the ones that are in Egypt, but that's okay. Nothing's gonna be like those because those ones are the best. More interesting than that is that we don't really know that much about them. Uh, they are notably in poor condition and scientists are still speculating on who, what, when, why and how. All we know is the where. It's in Greece. That's all we got so far. Kind of interesting though, you, you, think, you think pyramids are Egyptian, but no, they're in Greece too. I guess they're everywhere. Who knows? Anyway, number nine, Greek computer. The Antithic... The Antikythera? Antikythera? Antikythera. The Antikythera Mechanism. Ooh, I said that right, I hope. This sounds like something straight out of Call of Duty Zombies, but all right, I'll bite, I said to myself when looking at this strange contraption. In a nutshell, it's described as the oldest example of an analog computer, which is a fancy way of saying a basic or manual powered computer that calculates simple solutions and or outcomes. It might not sound like much, but to me, it's, well, it's pretty cool. I was born in a unique time. I saw home computers become mainstays in everyone's home, and then in the late 2000s become not even a second thought in everyone's home. By then, everyone just had a computer. It's kind of crazy how far we've come. Sure, this machine was simple, but it makes us wonder what else may have been lost to time, and it's speculated that it was used for calculating constellations, dates, and stuff like that. Simple, but very complicated. I know I can never build one. Pretty cool. Number eight. Greek cult, also known as the Eleusinian Mysteries. Super secret cult meeting with weird rules. Every generation has this. The Greeks had this. The founding fathers had the Freemasons. And we, we have anime. Anime North, right? No, I'm just kidding. I'm just, I, love, I love you guys, I'm just joking around. Trust me, there's some crazy clubs out there, man. This cult was so mysterious that well, the word mysterious kind of comes from that. It was all about Demeter and her daughter Persephone, and to join, you can't have unalive anybody. That was like the main rule. You can't, you gotta be, you can't have a, you can't have a rap sheet, bro. No rap sheet. Which, to be fair, is a good prerequisite. I wouldn't want anyone in my club to have that either. That's about where the info well dries up. We don't know that much about them. Kind of reminds me of the Assassin's Creed Templar stuff, though. Just saying, it's kind of weird, kind of similar. Number seven, Jason and the Argonauts. Avenger level threat acquired. For some reason in our lives, you find stories of our favorite heroes forming all mighty and powerful groups. The Avengers, the Justice League, BTS. That one, that one might have too much power. But yes, Jason and the Argonauts were a band of heroes on adventures, slaying beasts, taking names, and Greekifying the area. Sadly, for Jason and the Argonauts, every time they try and make a movie about it, it just, uh, just never worked for them, I don't know. They had a visually impressive one in the 60s and everything after that has just been a complete misfire. Hollywood, if your casting calls come my way, just, just know I make a great Jason. Look at me, I, I could be Jason. A sword, a shield, and there we go, that's it. Number six, the Colossus of Rhodes. Another one of the seven wonders of the ancient world is the Colossus of Rhodes, erected by Charles of Lindos in 280 BC. It was constructed to celebrate the successful defense of Rhodes City against an attack by Demetrius Poliokrates. That's the best you're gonna get, folks. Who had besieged it for a year with a large army and navy. According to modern descriptions, it was 33 meters high, or 108 feet in American. During an Arab conquest in 653, she was completely destroyed and all her scraps were melted down or sold. Since 2008, there has been talk of rebuilding this beauty and hell, I say why not? It would give me another reason to travel to Greece. I wanna do traveling, baby. I wanna get on my airplane for the first time. You know, get on there. Maybe make a vlog of it. That'd be kinda cool, right? Number five, the story of Mira. What is she pointing at? Ever been so sad and disheartened that you just you just wish you could turn into a tree? Yeah, me too. Then people could just leave me alone. How 
However, the only person to ever successfully transform into a tree was Mira, who turned into the Mer tree. But the story behind it is kind of uh, messed up. Mira loved her father. A little too much. Like way too much. She was in love with her father and desperately wanted to be with him. She knew it was wrong and tried everything to resist the gnawing desire inside of her, even trying to take her own life. Her nurse found her and fearing ever parting with her, decided to work up a scheme to hitch the two together. On the celebration of Bacchus, the queen hitched town, so the bed was empty. You see where this is going. Disguised as a maid, the nurse brought Mira to his bedchamber for 12 straight nights. On the final night, the king, overwhelmed with curiosity, removed the mask she was wearing. When he discovered that his lover had been his daughter, he reached for his sword and tried to kill her. Makes sense. Mira fled her father and ran across the desert for nine months and surprise, she was pregnant. Ugh. When she couldn't run anymore, she begged the gods to hide her from the world. They took pity on her and turned her into the Mer tree, which one day would be hit by a running boar, revealing the child Adonis tucked into the bark. Adonis was also supposed to be super hot and awesome, which totally doesn't play by the rules of like incest, like usually something goes wrong there. Remember Joffrey? Like that didn't go well. Number 4. Constitution of Athens the Declaration of Independence. Can you get a more important artifact from the past that shows how things worked? The Playbook on Democracy and Freedom. God bless America. That bad boy is locked up tight. It's important. Just make sure Nicolas Cage isn't anywhere near it. Well, the Constitution of Athens was equally as important, but uh, well, it wasn't Nicolas Cage, but we did lose it. Parts of it were recovered from a papyrus in the late 1800s, but more confusing than that is there seems to be two of them, for some reason. Uh, it doesn't seem to be a copy either. One possibly a student of Socrates, or perhaps one of Zenos. Truth is, uh, we're, we're not sure. And that's why it's on this list. At least we know John Hancock signed the Declaration of Independence. Put a big old signature right there. And that, now we know. And it's locked up. Nicholas Cage can't get it. Number three, Narcissus. This one's in the name. Basically, there was a guy named Narcissus. And he was gorgeous. Like George Clooney, Brad Pitt, Ryan Reynolds gorgeous. All just all put together. Oh. And he knew it, and he loved his image. Now, as a guy who goes on camera every day, naturally, you hate yourself. You hate your self image. That's how it goes. Ask anyone here, they would tell you the same thing. But also, as someone who's on camera every day and funny from time to time, you kind of like yourself on camera and you kind of like your self image. It's a very strange relationship we have. However, no one is as bad as it comes to as Narcissus. One day in the forest, he came across a body of water where he saw his reflection cast. And it was so handsome, so gorgeous, that he couldn't look away. Ever. Hence the name Narcissist, or Narcissist. Or what most girls in high school find out what their boyfriends have. Narcissism. Ladies, let me know. Have you ever dated someone who has narcissism or looked in the mirror too long? Let me know. I'm curious. Number two, Homer. Known as an overweight American family dad who resides in an unknown state at 742 Evergreen Terrace. Just kidding. We're talking about the smart Homer who arguably wrote two of the best literatures ever. The Iliad and the Odyssey. Some historians believe that Homer may not have actually existed though, and just like his yellow counterpart. There are some that think perhaps Homer was just a writer's name and it was actually a teamwork of actual writers who composed the work. It doesn't change the work, but uh, well, we'll probably just never know. Number one, Lost Island. Greeks seem to have a knack for losing islands in the ocean. Atlantis and now this. Today in what is just off the coast of the Dilkali Peninsula was the island of Arganusa and the city of Cain. Philosopher Xenophon talks of the city and its battles. However, if you look there now, you would not find very much, as the island has sunk and the city is gone. It's kind of hard to live underwater, we're not fish. Now in its place is the peninsula. A team of archaeologists in 2015 declared this was the site of Cain after discovering evidence of an ancient harbor. Ottoman maps depict the island being sunk as early as the 1600s. Look at that, you learn something every day here. Look at that. Number 10, Clash of the Titans. An Avengers level threat, baby. The Titans were the big bad giants who ruled over the earth and the gods. Naturally, they all got along and there were never any problems, ever. <laughs> yeah, right. They fought like cats and dogs. Though, I never understood that because all the dogs and cats I know always got along great. But the Titans fought and, and they fought some more. Until your favorite boy Zeus had enough and kind of took control over everything. It's Zeus, it's what he does. It's too bad Aaron Yeager wasn't there to help out. 
Number 9. Prometheus Poor Prometheus. This is my favorite tale from Greek mythology. I think it's rather sad for Prometheus. All he wanted to do was give us the knowledge of fire. And, and look at all the things that we did with it. Forged iron and steel, heated our homes, so no one would ever go cold again. And we cooked, which gave Gordon Ramsay 23 hit shows and a reason to curse when asking for the lamb sauce. Where's the lamb sauce? Prometheus went directly against Zeus's orders, and if you didn't know, that's kind of a bad thing. It can wind you up in a rather unfortunate position. A position like being chained up and having a large bird come feast on your intestines. Like I eat mom's spaghetti. She makes a good spaghetti, thanks mom. You make a good spaghetti. Number eight, Icarus. I think we can all relate to this one, or at least have been told a version of this when we were flush. Things were going good for us. In a nutshell, Icarus got some wax wings and gained the ability to flight. Mind you, that was probably the dream of many ancient peoples. After Icarus got his wings, he got a little arrogant. He wanted to push his wings to the limit. Kind of like Iron Man in the first Iron Man movie. But instead of falling in a multi-million dollar super suit and looking handsome while doing it, Icarus sniffed one too many of his own farts and flew too close to the sun where he burned up in it. So what's the lesson learned here, folks? Keep yourself grounded and don't sniff your own farts. <laughs> Number seven, Stone Cold. When the pandemic first began, one of the hardest things to get a hold of, surprisingly, was toilet paper. Yeah, it's pretty important. It's more important than we realized, because that was the thing on the news that we saw, people just boxing each other at a Walmart for toilet paper. When you run out of toilet paper, you often remember that moment, regardless of where you are forever. Leaves of three, let them be. That's all I'm saying. But ancient Greeks used these small ceramic pieces to wipe. Yeah, ceramic pieces, like sharp. French anthropologist Philippe Charlier expands on this toilet hygiene history in the British Medical Journal. It was these flat terracotta discs found in these ancient sites and they had residue on them, so the proof's in the pudding. They also discovered a Greek cup which said three stones are enough to wipe one's arse. Three stones. See, even today it's like three pieces, you know, three slices, three stones. It's always three. Yeah, Greeks would use pebbles to wipe their butts. Never take the go for granted ever again. Number six, Hercules. Hercules, Hercules, the strong one, or the one where Danny DeVito coaches him through the process of being a Greek legend. If Danny DeVito is coaching you through anything, that probably means you're gonna come out on top. And yes, before you start typing in the comment section, technically speaking, Hercules is the Roman copy of Heracles. I know. However, it's kind of one of those things that everyone just knows the one. So anytime a Greek dude shows up with muscles, you blush and you think of Hercules. As far as Greek mythology goes, it doesn't get any more classic than a super strong guy with abs and biceps. And maybe a little bit of olive oil on, I don't know. Number five, Circe and the pigs. Circe wasn't so much considered a, as much a goddess, though she was one, more like a witch or an enchantress. She was the daughter of Helios, and depending on your sources, she was also the daughter of Hecate. This story is confusing because no one can really define whether she was the villain of the story or just like sad and lonely. The story goes as follows. The great hero Odysseus and his crew after months at sea happen upon her island. He sends his men ashore to investigate and find a cottage surrounded by magnificent yet docile beasts. Circe is heard singing, and when the men greet her, she invites them in for a hearty meal, and after months at sea, that's, that's amazing. Unbeknownst to them, though, the food is enchanted, and the men all turn into pigs. Odysseus discovers this, and after Hermes places a protective charm on him, he confronts her. Her charms were powerless on him because of Hermes, so she invited him into bed instead. Yeah, sure, why not? This is also out of character for Odysseus because he was super in love with his wife back home, but I guess he couldn't say no because she was a goddess, and hey, sexy times. Circe realizes who he was, and having been foretold that Odysseus would be the only man to resist her, she lifted the curse on the men. She also made them hotter in the process, as a, like, I'm really sorry. And then they all stayed for a year, because I guess, why not? They just stayed for a year. I don't know why. When they decided to finally leave, Cersei ended up giving him a bunch of info to protect him, so I guess like she turned into a friend after all. And I, yeah, it's just weird. Why would you stay on an island that turns you into pigs? I don't know. I don't know. Do you? Number four, King Midas. The lesson in this one, folks, is to be careful what you wish for. King Midas was being granted a wish. He wished for anything I touch be turned to gold. Now, I'm not an economist because I already have too many jobs on the internet, but you can imagine how at today's rate of gold, how wealthy you would be. Sheesh! 
Sheesh. Yeah, gold was valuable back then, but now, wow, we So his wish was granted, and everything he touched turned to gold, which, for a good couple hours, must have been the most fun anyone has ever had, ever. Dude was seeing drachma signs. However, this wealthy gift he had been given quickly turned into a curse or a burden. Everything he touched turned to gold, that included his food. Because of this, he starved. To fix this burden, he bathed in a river, and it said that's why gold can be found in that river. I wouldn't mind having that power myself, but if I made food gold, or even worse, what if I made my beer gold? Number 3, Boys Club Hypatia was a female philosopher at the Library of Alexandria, something that any archaeologist or historian would give their right kidney to witness in its glory. What's so scandalous about her, besides being a woman with knowledge that would scare a lot of men at the time? <sighs> Things were alright until a Christian mob discovered she was a pagan. Well, this certainly could not stand, and in probably the weirdest assassination attempt ever, she was unalived by being sliced with clamshells. Or roof tiles. The translation gets a little lost. Regardless, we're not playing Clue here, so it doesn't matter if the Christian mob uses the shells in the library or not. The fact is, an intelligent woman who taught others was removed for no good reason. Number 2, Medusa. I feel like a lot of people know this one. Medusa, the half beautiful lady, half head of snakes in her head, and, and half monster thing with powers. Yes, I realize that was three halves and that doesn't add up, but you're talking to a guy who was voted class clown in the high school yearbook and not voted most likely to succeed in math. I just wouldn't. But she was the Gorgon monster who would turn men into stone. I, I, I do know that. If they looked into her eyes. That was until your boy Perseus showed up like Link with a mirror shield and gave her a taste of her own medicine. What's the lesson on this one? I'm not sure. Maybe it's don't be so sure of your abilities. Maybe it's seeing things through. Or maybe it's having an extensive knowledge of tactics from a late 90s Nintendo character. That you, you never know when you're gonna need that. You never know. I, I, I know that stuff. That can come in handy. Number one, Pandora's box. I know you guys know this one, but this one is so simple. At first glance, it's not about turning things into gold or weird snakehead ladies or giants rising from beneath the earth to fight each other. It's a box. Something ain't good in that box, but it's just a box. So don't open it. I'm going to say it again because there's going to be people in the comment section that are going to say, but Chetty, because you said don't open it, that means I really want to open it. Imagine I'm Robert De Niro telling you not to open it. Nope, no way. Nope, not going to happen. Nope, null and void. Don't do it. Don't do it. That's how you know I'm serious because I did a bad impression. Oh great, somebody opened it. Yes, that's right. Pandora's box was opened and it said that all the evils of the world were released from the box. Good tale, good moral, but who the heck thought putting all those evil things in the world in the box was a great idea? Whatever happened to just having memento boxes? You know, you open up a thing, look, this is the time I farted on camera, this is the time I went to the cottage, you know what I mean? Whatever happened to that? Kicking off the list at number 10, the bird. The bird is not the word. It's actually pretty offensive. To flip somebody the bird or to flip somebody off, of course, means to give them the middle finger. What are these little troublesome guys right here, one of these blurry dudes right here. Do we even know why we do this? I mean, I don't recommend it because obviously you'll get in a heap of trouble from whoever's on the other end, the receiving end of said finger. But giving somebody the middle finger comes from the fourth century BC in Athens. The philosopher Dino Genes expressed how he felt visitors about Demosthenes. He described him by making a, well, you guessed it, a middle finger. It's a phallic gesture. The middle finger is supposed to be your, you know, the your bird, for lack of a better term, and the surrounding curled fingers are meant to be the, you know, the other things that are around said thing on the body. I'm trying not to say what I really want to say here, but the bird is meant to, you know, it's supposed to be one of those. The more you know, ancient Greek history, who would have thunk? Number nine. Columors. While the Greeks were going head to head with the Turks, they were fighting over their independence, of course, and the Greeks had the upper hand at Acropolis one day. They were surrounding their enemy and they had this stronghold in their grasp, and the Turks at the same time were running out of ammo and options. They then began to break apart the marble columns around them, just smashing them to pieces, just breaking them as fast as they can to try and get lead from inside and use that as ammo. Now, as the Greeks witnessed the destruction of their Parthenon, they panicked, obviously. They said, here, just take ammo instead. Whatever you do, just don't break those columns. We can keep fighting. In fact, we'll supply you the ammunition. Just don't break those columns. And they did. 1821, Greek War of Independence. Here you go, Ottoman Empire. Take this lead. Now we can fight. Let's do it. It's like when you're at a house party, they're like, just fight each other. Just don't put a hole in the wall. I'll be grounded. Seriously. I can't fix that. I don't know how to. Number eight, zombies. It doesn't matter what the context is, zombies are always scared. Whenever we talk about ancient Egyptians, we break down the process of mummification. 
And you know what, I'll be honest, I missed that part. Just keep everything in jars, keep everything separate in different rooms, keep everything safe, surrounded by treasure in the middle of a tomb. No zombie is coming back to life if that's the case, you know what I mean? Well, ancient Greeks actually believed in zombies as well. They had steps they would take to prevent the dead from ever walking again. Archaeologists found graves where bodies were weighed down with rocks, or they would be pinned to their tombs. One of the two, both pretty horrible. They weren't called zombies, of course, but rather revenants. Reanimated corpses that return to terrorize the living. AKA zombies, <laughs> it's a zombie. Dr. Solowski Weaver explains that bodies found at a cemetery near the ancient town of Camarina in Southeast Sicily were feared to come back to life at one point. The town was once a Greek colony, of course now modern day Italy, but it's home to a third century cemetery with around 3000 bodies in there. There's more than half of them that are buried with coins, the usual, but a few of them were found in specific ways, peculiar ways. One body found in tomb 653, their body was covered in large fragments of amphora. So it's whatever it was underneath there, they didn't want that to move. Which is weird, because you're like, okay, I know that they're dead, why are we putting a rock on them, you know? That, that fear, we still have it today. Number seven, Jason and the Argonauts. Avenger level threat acquired. For some reason in our lives, you find stories of our favorite heroes forming almighty and powerful groups. The Avengers, the Justice League, BTS. That one, that one might have too much power. But yes, Jason and the Argonauts were a band of heroes on adventures, slaying beasts, taking names, and Greekifying the area. Sadly, for Jason and the Argonauts, every time they try and make a movie about it, it just, uh, it just never works for them. I don't know. They had a visually impressive one in the 60s, and everything after that has just been a complete misfire. Hollywood, if your casting calls come my way, just, just know I make a great Jason. Look at me. I, I could be Jason. A sword, a shield, and there we go. That's it. Number six. Naked exercise. Okay, this one, honestly, I'm just saying it's unusual, but I'm on board with it. You ever forget a towel when you're showering? You gotta do that weird, naked, silly run through the hallway. I'll be honest with you guys, that's my favorite run. I feel like one of those aliens from Signs, just walking around all light, naked, and lanky. Just meant for speed, you know, meant for greatness. Just wet, just like a lizard, just slipping around all over the kitchen. Ancient Greeks used to work out naked. The word gymnasium translates to the Greek term gymnasion, which meant school for naked exercise. Yeah, growing up, I always wanted to go to Xavier's school for gifted youngsters. Now, I just want to go to Ezekiel's school for naked exercise. Just don't set up shop behind the guy working on his squats. That's probably a bad idea. You know what? The more I think of this, the more I convince myself it's a pretty terrible idea. Hey man, do you mind spotting me? Sure. Number five. Well, I have the high ground, Anakin. According to a disputable legend, however, given my semi-okay Palpatine impression, I had to include this on the list. Basically, M. Docules was a smart dude and had just earned himself a decent track record. He helped save people. Dude was credible. He gained somewhat of a following afterwards, almost to the point of worship. This may have gone to his head as he started to believe his own divineness and jumped into an active volcano, where strangely enough, he does not come out of it. Now I wonder what would have caused that to happen. Perhaps maybe he didn't have a certain galactic friend who was the Senate, the whole Senate, and nothing but the Senate, and could shoot lightning out of his fingertips and help out of someone of the burning lava, yes. Number four, bronze bowl. On a list of unusual things ancient Greeks did, I think it's fair to throw in the bronze or the brazen bull. There was a bronze sculpture, often in the shape of a bull. Yeah, obviously. Usually it was large enough to fit a person inside. Yeah, it's, I think I saw this in a Saw movie one time. That's how, you know it's, that's how you know it's good. Once the person was locked inside, a fire would then be set underneath this bronze bowl, and then you could probably figure out the rest of that situation and what happens to the victim inside. We'll say victim inside, not person. Victim. Horrible, horribly, painfully... It's, it's all bad. They engineered the bull so that when somebody screamed inside, it sounded like a bull's roar. <laughs> That's haunting. That's actually really horrible. Every time I talk about this, I'm like, mm, this is real life. Real people did this. It was designed originally for Phalaris. He was a horrible ruler. He ruled around 560 BC, but the sculpture for Phalaris was built by Perilous, the guy who made the brazen bull. He was sadly the first victim. That's why you don't make torture devices, but I don't know. And coming up to our top three, we have number three, Procrustes. Theseus dealt with a lot of interesting characters and Procrustes was exactly how his name sounds. 
crusty. If you ever find yourself wrapped up in a scheme designed to enforce uniformity by violent methods, then you may use the term Procrustean bed to adequately describe it. Procrustes was a serial taker of lives who had a very special bed. He would, like Skyron, soothe very weary travelers into a false sense of security by offering them a bed to stay for in the night. However, if you didn't fit on the bed, which no one did, he would either violently stretch you or trim you to put it delicately so that you would fit the bed. Obviously, all the travelers ended up dead. The notorious criminal lived between Athens and Ulysses, so coming across travelers was pretty easy. It was just a matter of time before Theseus would encounter him and set the record straight. Having heard of his crimes, Theseus decided to turn the tables and make Procrustes fit his own bed. So. What's even more confusing about this story is that Procrustes was the son of Poseidon, and so technically was Theseus' brother, so in a way, Theseus kind of committed fratricide, but Procrustes wasn't really behaving with godlike intentions, so I'm not sure where you can draw the line there. Number two, the Battle of Marathon. Every New Year's, there's always that one guy on Facebook or Instagram who just becomes a runner, just overnight, just they have the little squirt water belt thing that they they shoot it, you know, the whole thing, the whole setup, and they train ideally for a marathon. That's the big thing that they talk about for an entire year, this marathon. What is a marathon? Was it a person or is it just a name for 42 kilometers? Well, it was actually a battle back in 490 BC. That's how it kicked off. Between ancient Greeks and Persian invaders sent by King Darius, the Persians arrived to Marathon, there was about 20,000 of them, and they arrived to punish the Greeks for supporting the Lonians, who revolted against the Persians. Now the Greeks were outnumbered here at this point, but they attacked hard and they attacked fast. They took out 6,000 Persians and eventually they just fled the scene entirely. The number of Greek fighters lost was around 200, so far less casualties. The story of Phidippides came to be at this time. He ran the first ever marathon. He ran all the way from Marathon to Athens to deliver messages because Blackberry wasn't a thing, obviously. So some guys had to be like, you bet. <laughs> Imagine servers back then, they're like, would you want a large soda? You got. He was one of the Greek military men known as day long runners. He did six marathons back to back. My knees hurt just saying that, you know what I mean? So next time you see somebody on Facebook become a marathon runner, just post a link to this video and be like, you got it. You're almost, just do six in a row and you're good. Also do six in a row naked in the heat and you're good. And finally, number one, human sacrifice. Of course, we gotta end on something crazy like this. We found the remains of a 3000 year old skeleton in Greece. They found the skeleton on the side of Mount Lycaon, which historians know as the site of animal sacrifice for Zeus. I don't know why I pointed up, but probably not down or yeah, Zeus, he's up there, yeah. Ancient writers mentioned this site and how human sacrifice was also at play here. And now thanks to technology, we can confirm that this was for sure the case. We talked about zombies earlier and how bodies would be buried with like rocks in them and stuff. This is a bit different. This is actually much different. The upper part of the skull that was found was missing, first of all, and the body was laid on two lines of stones with stone slaps just laid on their pelvis. Now Greece, of course, is the birthplace of philosophy and democracy and all that good stuff, but they also did some sacrificial shady stuff in their off time as well when they weren't slamming water down Merlot. Science allowed us to look all over the world too, not just Greece. There's ancient Egyptians, Aztecs, sometimes after Mayan ball games, the losing team would be sacrificed. Yeah, that's pretty brutal. Everyone talks about how awful humans are now. Well, we've always been the worst. The Greeks just like to party while they were doing it. Number 10. Dionysus, man. Dionysus was like never a dull moment. He literally exploded into existence after his mother Semele burst into pieces when Zeus showed her his true form because he was tricked by Hera as a whole thing. Then Zeus continued the gestation period by carrying him in his thigh. Ever since then, he took on the responsibility of being god of fertility, wine, winemaking and madness. So essentially the party god, the frat boy of Olympus. However, some say that Dionysus was a result of a union between Zeus and Persephone, which is like even more confusing, but hey, it's what it's a myth, so let's go. But the most famous story about him revolves around the back eye and the story interpreted by Euripides. Pentheus, the king of Thebes, banished the worship of Dionysus and forbade the women of the kingdom from participating in the Bacchus. You can bet Frat Boy wasn't happy about this. He doesn't like being banned. He cast a spell of madness on all the women of the kingdom to attend the festival. So Pentheus caught him somehow and imprisoned him, but you can't chain a god. Dionysus decided on his revenge. He transformed into an irresistibly beautiful woman and lured Pentheus to spy on the Bacchic rituals. When the Maenads spotted him, they thought he was a wild dog. He 
Peeping Tom more like. So they tore him limb from limb. One of the attackers was his mother, Agave, who didn't know the animal was actually her son in the madness that she was wrapped up in. So. Yeah, there are plenty more stories regarding this rascal, but this will have to wait for part three. Number nine, Lysurgus. We talked about Mira in part one, you know, the woman who slept with her father and then turned into a tree from which she gave birth. If you don't know what I'm talking about, go watch part one right now. Yeah, weird times. Well, here is another plant story that's equally as confusing. I know branches can sometimes look like arms, but how do you confuse your son for one? Uh, well, Dionysus has to be involved. Lysurgus attacked and injured the aforementioned party god, Dionysus, and needless to say, the gods were not happy about it. Dionysus was basically doing a pub crawl with wine in the mortal realm, and Lysurgus wasn't jazzed about it because he was a messy dude. As punishment, Dionysus descended upon him with madness. In this violent state, Lysurgus saw a pile of weeds that he just had to get out of his garden, so he took an axe and chopped them away. Little did he know that it was actually his very own son that he was chopping to pieces. He also took the life of the rest of his family, and he even took off his own legs in his madness. After he finally passed away, he was entombed in a rock as a sign of disrespect for offending the gods. So moral of the story. Don't whine about the man of the vine, who likes to party all the time. Don't do it. Number eight, Hera the Virgin. The most confusing thing in all of Greek mythology was Hera and Zeus's marriage. Sometimes you just gotta know when it's time to call it quits. Between them being siblings, Zeus cheating on her all the time, Hera killing people over jealousy and spite. Things were just messy. But did you know that Hera actually grew back her virginity? Annually? Not at all possible to rebuild that in real life, but if you're a god, then anything is possible. Hera was the goddess of virginity and was worshipped as the goddess of matrimony, virginity, and marriage. Though she was married, albeit unhappily, she was revered as a virgin, which clearly she wasn't. So in order to maintain this, she renewed her virginity every year by bathing in the spring of Canathus. The rites performed in order to do this were kept a secret and never spoken of, but she did it. This meant that people could still revere her for it and she could pretend for a moment that Zeus and her never got jiggy with it because obviously she'd, she'd want to forget that. After all, being a faithful wife to an unfaithful husband doesn't sound like a grand old time if you ask me. Number 7. High Fashion I say if you got it, flaunt it. Humbly of course. Maybe a nice pair of shoes, your favorite pants, or for me, a brand new suit that makes me feel gorgeous, baby, yeah. But for the most part, I shop at Walmart. Let's be honest, I don't have that kind of money for the Gucci flip flops down to the socks. However, for the great Greek philosophers like Socrates, they were wealthy enough to enjoy a literal finer cut of cloth. Yes, they could, but Socrates said no. I want the peasant look, please. Apparently, the wise Greek man often didn't wear shoes and always wore the same ratty coat. It's also said that Socrates wasn't exactly a good looker. Put on some shoes, though. That'd be rough. You're walking around all day with no shoes on? Oh, those would be rough looking feet, buddy. Number six, Tyrius, Procne, and Philomela. Okay, this one is probably the most messed up out of all the Greek tales, at least in my book. Trigger warnings galore here, folks. I'll try to be delicate. Tereus was the son of Ares and the king of Thrace. He married Procne, who was the eldest daughter of Pandion, the king of Athens. The two fell fast in love, but the Furies prepared their marriage bed and howled all night over their union. A very, very bad omen. Soon Procne longed for her little sister Philomela to join her, so Tereus went to fetch her from Athens. But as soon as he saw her, he was consumed by lust. Despite promising her father he'd protect her, he stole Philomela away and ravaged her. She promised she'd tell everyone what he did, so in order to stop that from happening, he cut out her tongue. He hid her away and told Procne that she'd been lost at sea and perished. For a year, Philomela snuck cloth from the maid that would care for her and wove a tapestry that told her story. The maid secretly brought the cloth to Procne and she immediately sought out her sister. Fueled by rage, she took her revenge. She stole the life of their own son, Itis, and fed him to Tereus for dinner. When he called for him, Procne revealed her sister and pointed to the stew that the king had finished. Tereus flew into a rage and gave chase, but the two women changed into birds to evade him. Birds, okay. Procne turned into a swallow, Philomela a nightingale, and Tereus soon followed suit by the ravenous hoopoo bird. 
Would have thought it would be like a raven or like a hawk, but nope, he got the hoopoo bird. Okay. Number five, Sisyphus. Oh baby, do I feel this one. Story of my life, honestly, day late and a dollar short. Some of you folks at home may also share the same fate as me and this chiseled Greek man doomed for eternity. This one is also one of my favorites. Basically, Sisyphus was cheating the devil. Cheating death itself, actually. After sliming his way out of the underworld one too many times, Big Daddy Zeus had to intervene. Also, when I say I relate to him, it's not because I'm a trickster who cheats my demise or cheats the, the devil or, or Hades. I'll explain. So, after Sisyphus had done what he'd done, Zeus sentenced him to roll a giant boulder up a hill for eternity. When he gets to the top, she rolls back down to the bottom and he has to start all over again. Every day for the rest of time. Not just life, for time. Sometimes in life it feels like you're on a grind and you work and work and work and sometimes you go right back to square one no matter how hard you work. That sucks and that can be exhausting. But never give up because Chetty ain't and neither should you. Number four, Hercules holds a giant off the ground. The taller you stand, the farther you have to fall. A lesson the tall people of the world will understand. As a requirement for the 12 trials of Hercules, our great hero had to defeat a massive giant. This ginormous form was named Antaeus, an undefeatable immortal so long as his feet remained on the ground. His mother was Gaia, the goddess of the earth, so like all his powers came from her. Duh. Antaeus was a big fan of wrestling. He loved it. And Hercules was a big strong guy, so they went at it. But in order to defeat him, all Hercules had to do was lift him off the ground and wait until his power drained from him. And that was that. Because if he threw him on the ground, he would just like regenerate. So that sounds more like a prolonged piggyback than wrestling, but you know, whatever gets the job done. Good for you, buddy. Number three, Greek statues. Okay, I'll lighten up the mood a little bit. The last one was a bit dark. We've all done this at one point. Maybe you're at a museum and you see a statue. It's right there in front of you. It's carved, it's pure beauty. It's massive. The warrior represented has like 15 abs. It's made of bronze, eight feet tall. The amount of detail gone into their body is jaw dropping. Truly, it's impressive. But did you know that ancient Greeks would make their their, their bird, uh, small, on purpose. Uh? On purpose. Yeah, men who were well endowed were more often than not fools. They were foolish, Only they only ruled for lust, right? They were just craved fools with big birds. If you had a big brain, however, oh, you were the talk of the town. Ladies would whisper about you when you passed by in the street. Did you hear about Brian's big brain? Oh my God. He's got his dad's brain. Whenever an actor would play a fool on stage, they would be given a comedically large uh, setup, you know? That's how you know he's the villain or the fool, the bad guy in the scenario. The way we see these statues today meant that they had self-control and intelligence. I always thought they were just in a cold room when they were getting their stuff carved, but that's what this channel's for. History, but make it a little silly. Number two, Tantalus and Pelops. This one. Considering Tantalus was in such good rapport with the gods, I'm not sure why he did this. As we know, being on the gods' bad side even slightly leads to some pretty harsh punishment, so imagine really being on their bad side. Tantalus was the king of the land that is now Turkey today, and the gods thought he was just swell. So great, they'd even visit him from time to time for dinner. That sounds pretty good, man. Maybe they were awful dinner guests or something, but eventually Tantalus wanted to see how far he could push his luck. He devised a test that would determine whether the gods were all knowing. He could have been like, how many fingers do I have behind my back? He could have been like, uh, how many apples are in my dungeon? He, he could have done something random like that. But instead, he did the last thing you would think of. Tantalus killed his son Pelops, cooked him up and served him for dinner. Of course, the gods were wise to it as soon as they sat down and considering a father eating his children was a pretty sensitive topic, Kronos, they were not pleased. The only god who ate some of Pelops was Demeter who was blinded by grief over the loss of her daughter Persephone because she was downstairs with Hades. Needless to say, they were pissed. Zeus threw Tantalus into the abyss of Tartarus to endure an eternity of torment. His punishment was to spend the rest of time waist deep in water with a fruit tree hanging above him. Each time he went to take a drink, the water receded and every time he went to take a bite of the fruit, the wind would blow it off course. However, as soon as he stopped lunging for it, everything would return back to normal and tempt him even further. Happy ending for Pelops though, since Demeter ate part of him, they brought him back to life and he was turned into ivory. Pretty good. 
pretty good for him. Number one, Endymion. This story isn't exactly linear, so it remains one of the most confusing tales because it was likely pieced together. The issue for historians is that no complete story exists of it today, but we know it's about the love between the goddess of the moon, Selene, and a human man. In some versions, he was the son of Thelius. Others say he was raised by him, but was actually the son of Zeus. Some say he was a shepherd, others a king, but either way, this guy spent a lot of time outside at night beneath the moon. Sometimes he would even stay up all night charting the path of the moon, ignoring the desire to sleep. Soon Selene fell deeply in love with Endymion, a strikingly handsome mortal man. Selene could no longer ignore her desire and decided to visit her love, abandoning the sky altogether. Softly, gently, she crept up upon him to avoid frightening him, but the two were swept away by the throes of love, but her adoration distracted her from her duties. In addition to that, Endymion was mortal, meaning their love would be short-lived in his mortal life. So Zeus, either for punishment or pity of Selene, put her lover into a deep, frozen sleep so that she may always see her love as a young man. But little more is known, actually, if that was punishment or pity. But hey, it's kind of beautiful. Number 10, the classic. Alexander the Great is probably the most infamous person on this list. Shout out again to my late 90s PC gamers, but because of Age of Empires and Civilization games, you are probably familiar with old Alexander, one of the great conquerors of ancient times. So what does that mean exactly? Well, the man wasn't asking for land with please and thank you. He was asking with a spear and a shield, sort of style. And by asking, I mean just taking. However, for the brutal, handsome young king of many lands, his time to bask in his empire was short-lived as he died soon after Persia was conquered. His achievements cannot be understated, however. Conquering so much at such a young age was very impressive. Comparative to the mythological Achilles in grandeur. Number 9. A Man in His Barrel this is going to be very difficult to talk about, simply because I find the premise of this to be comedy gold. Okay, close your eyes. Imagine ancient Greece. A city like Athens is populated with the wealthy in gowns and robes, and maybe even a stereotypical toga. Buildings of white stone and marble. A market bustling with people haggling for fresh produce and cloth. Perhaps even a fountain with some flowers. Beautiful, isn't it? However, just around the corner, not too far from the town square, there's a barrel. A barrel that's shaking vigorously. And what is causing this barrel to shake? Well, that would be the man who lives in it, Diogenes. Yes, a philosopher who was self-gratifying himself in a barrel in public. Diogenes defended his behavior by saying how he wished it was as easy to relieve hunger by rubbing an empty stomach. Yeah, I was sitting in my study earlier when a courier handed me a letter. I opened the letter in a warm candlelight glow. It was from the chief. And he said that's not it. Number 8, Trendsetter. As if doing what Diogenes did in public wasn't bad enough, and I mean, come on, that's, that's pretty scandalous, he also would commonly defecate in public theaters and urinate on those he found annoying. Sure, maybe major cities need people like this. I mean, come on, would New York City really be New York City if crazy people don't yell at you on the streets all the time? Huh? Diogenes just may have been the first to do such crazy things. Also, I'd like to argue his philosophy. If you just give me a moment, if he pees on people who are annoying him, could the people that are being peed on not deem that annoying and then do the same in return? I'm not a smart guy like the Greek leaders, but at least I know how to use a washroom. Just saying. Number seven, Skyron. I don't know about you, but if someone washed my feet for me, the first thing I would do would say, thank you. Full stop. Like, that's it. The last thing I would do is blast them off a cliff with said clean toesies. Already there are a few things I never thought I would say to thousands of people. <laughs> but what a great intro to the story of Skyron. Skyron was a bandit who was obsessed with killing people after and while they washed his feet. Everybody's got their thing, I guess. He would call travelers on the road to help him wash his feet, which a surprising amount of people agreed to do, right? Imagine someone asking you to do that today. You just hear a voice pleading from a dark alley to like, please wash my feet, wash my feet. I need someone to wash my feet. Would you go? Serious question. Anyways, when these extremely kind people would offer help, he would kick them in the face and push them over a cliff. Yeah. To add insult to injury, at the base of the cliff was a man eating tortoise who would eat the remains of the either dead or still alive 
people. Talk about kicking a man while they're down. He got away with this too many times. <laughs> Imagine the parents having to warn their kids not to wash random people's feet. Thankfully, Theseus, Poseidon's son, butted in and threw him off the very cliff he so enjoyed in his pastime. I like how the crime fits the punishment here. You know? It's satisfying. I like it. It's good. Good storytelling. Number six, smart streaker. Anyone that's ever spent time with a physics professor has probably heard the story a hundred times, and that professor probably genuinely thinks this is a funny story. Archimedes, the famed Greek philosopher, made a strange discovery. Strangely. One night after a long day of hard thinking, he went to take a bath. Pondering the questions of life, he noticed something was happening in the tub. No, not his rubber ducky going missing, but rather a simple yet interesting concept of displacement. When he was submerged in the water, the water rose. He deducted that if he measures the difference, that would equal his weight of volume. And if it works with an old man, then it would work with other things as well. He was so excited by this that he shot up and ran outside screaming, Eureka, Eureka. Well, that part may not have happened, but if it did, I'd hate to be his neighbor. No one wants to see that, man. Number five, wine time. When we think of ancient Greeks, we think of wine and parties and apparently naked exercise, right? But was it really a drunken festival of love all the time? I mean, hangovers are a thing, right? We need some recovery days. When did Gatorade get invented? I don't know, this is it's probably hard to keep up. Ancient Greeks actually rarely drank wine without diluting the hell out of it first. To water the wine, the ratio was four to one or five to two. Either way, it's, it's just water at that point. So you'll be hydrated, that's for sure, which is great, but you're not really getting drunk, so I don't know what the point was. Regular Joes would drink at taverns and the rich would throw house parties, so some things, of course, have stayed the same after all these years, but ancient Greeks believed that drinking undiluted wine could cause blindness or insanity. My friend, I think that's just called blacking out. I don't know, who knows? If you did happen to drink too much wine, the fourth century poet Amphis, he's got your back. Best way to cure those ancient hangovers was to boil some cabbage. Nice, just what you wanna smell after a night out. And in order to keep the party going without embarrassing yourself off some sparkling Shiraz, the best way to party and stay sober was to bake and eat a pig's lung. That's the trick to never getting drunk in ancient Greek times. Again though, I think that was just eating food. I think eating food helps before you drink. Either way, if you're gonna drink, do so responsibly. Eat some pig lung and then you'll be good. Number four, manure burial. Heraclitus had edema, which is basically some bloating in the hands and feet due to excess water and fluids in the body. Not a big deal. Although sometimes in ancient times, all diseases were serious because, well, in ancient times, frankly, a papyrus cut could be the difference between you attending the next celebration of town or taking a cruise down the river Styx. Heraclitus had a solution for this. As a learned man, he was never wrong. So what was his scientific medical solution to his ailment that might have gone away on its own? Well, he basically buried himself in manure so it would get rid of the excess water in his body. Yeah, I, I don't know how that works either. Unfortunately, he was attacked and eaten by wild dogs in his mud bath. He did not make it out. Number three, Narcissus. This one's in the name. Basically, there was a guy named Narcissus, and he was gorgeous. Like George Clooney, Brad Pitt, Ryan Reynolds gorgeous. I'll just all put together, ugh. And he knew it, and he loved his image. Now, as a guy who goes on camera every day, naturally, you hate yourself. You hate your self-image, that's how it goes. Ask anyone here, they would tell you the same thing. But also, as someone who's on camera every day, and funny from time to time, you kind of like yourself on camera, and you kind of like your self-image. It's a very strange relationship we have. However, no one is as bad as it comes to as narcissists. One day in the forest, he came across a body of water where he saw his reflection cast. And it was so handsome, so gorgeous, that he couldn't look away, ever. Hence the name Narcissist, or Narcissist. Or what most girls in high school find out what their boyfriends have, Narcissism. Ladies, let me know, have you ever dated someone who has Narcissism or looked in the mirror too long? Let me know, I'm curious. Number two, countrymen, Lend me your ears. Zeno of Elea was a learned man, and in a rebellion against his leader Nearchus. He was captured, and received the beating only a stepson would know. However, in Zeno's final act of defense, he asked Nearchus to come close so that he could whisper in his ear. And channeling his inner Mike Tyson, reeled back his head, and came in to take a bite out of his ear like Scruff McGruff the dog takes a bite out of crime. Sure, he was victorious, but history tends to remember things like that. You got a page in a textbook somewhere, Zeno. Number one, Zeus. Does this man deserve an introduction? Here's another topic that could honestly be its own video. Zeus, the god of gods, the man with all the power and the affinity for tossing lightning bolts the same way Gordon Ramsay tosses salads. But I'll just write them off for you. Turned his first wife into a fly and ate her. Constantly unfaithful to his other wives. 
Tied Prometheus to a rock and had his liver eaten by a bird. Wiped out humanity. Cursed a man to push a boulder up a steep hill for eternity. And made Atlas put the world on his shoulders. Shout out to my people in the audience who get anxiety trying to order a pizza over the phone. Now imagine you have to literally hold the whole world on your shoulders. Oh, too much pressure. Yes, I know Zeus is mythological, but a lot of others on this could be as well. This was a long time ago. Some documents just didn't live that long. <laughs>